this is a collected volume. Uh, now, uh, the collected volume is the subject of some prejudice. Uh, even if it has some thematic coherence, it doesn't weave one story. The usual question about a book, which is what is it about, is hard to answer. Uh, one answer, of course, is that it's about the author, a chance to show off the range of his or her competencies, and I'll admit that there's some of that here. But I decided not to throw everything I'd done into this book, but to select pieces related to the theme that's evoked by its title. The War on Error is, of course, catchy and memorable, but as I explained in the introduction, it points seriously to what I've attempted to do again and again in the years since 9-11. It's to run down errors before they become assumed wisdom. Now, this can be a frustrating ent enterprise. Uh, the essayist Jonathan Swift famously wrote, if a lie be believed for only an hour, it has done its work, and there is no further occasion for it. Uh, falsehood flies, and the truth comes limping after it. Uh, I think that's even truer about errors than it is about deliberate lies, uh, because errors are made often with the force of conviction. Uh, I define them for my purposes as unintentional lapses that leave a gap between reality and its representation. Now, the fact that they're unintentional doesn't mean that they're random. Uh, the form of an error is usually determined by bias. Let me illustrate with a sample from the book. Uh, the flagship essay is my dissection of a chapter in Ari Shavit's 2013 bestseller, My Promised Land. Uh, the chapter deals with the Israeli conquest of Lydda in July 1948. The New Yorker magazine made that chapter famous by excerpting it, and most reviewers flagged it as the most significant and emotive chapter in the book. Um, Shavit, as you may recall, posited that there had been a massacre in Lydda of innocent Palestinians by vengeful Israeli troops. Not only a massacre, but the largest of the 1948 war, more than double the size of the infamous Dir Yassin massacre. There were several acts, there were several acts in, in Shavit's play, but the most dramatic was an alleged Israeli attack on a small mosque filled with civilians. According to Shavit, a traumatized soldier in a spasm of vengeance fired an anti-tank rocket into the mosque, killing many, and his enraged comrades then burst into the mosque and killed the rest, 70 in all. Shavit said his account drew upon conversations with some Israeli veterans, conversations he had taped some 20 years earlier. Uh, in Shavit's telling, Lida embodies the tragic, if inevitable, costs imposed by Zionism on the Palestinians. Now, most people read this chapter, and they were shaken by it. I read it, and I shook my head in, in doubt. I thought it sounded contrived, theatrical. Not only was there something implausible in the depiction of events, there was something caricatured in the depiction of the commanders and the soldiers. So I asked myself whether there might be a way to check the story. Shavit wasn't working from a public archive, but from a private one, his own. All the people he had interviewed were dead. Uh, but it occurred to me that the very same veterans Shavit interviewed might have been interviewed by someone else. So I went to the Palmach archives, and there I found a trove of interviews with the very same people Shavit had interviewed. And I discovered that by listening to the testimony of the very same people, I could tell an entirely different story about Lydda, not the story of a massacre, but of a battle, not of vengeance, but of fear. Now, Benny and I disagree over just how much of what happened was a battle in the small mosque and outside it. That's the crux of our exchange. It covers 50 pages. I urge you to read it in the book. Uh, neither of us claims to know exactly what happened, but we differ about the preponderance of evidence. But the crucial passage in this central chapter of uh, my Promised Land purports to describe something that happened after the shooting stopped. Let me quote that passage. News comes of what has happened in the small mosque. The Israeli military governor orders his men to bury the dead, get rid of the incriminating evidence. At night, when they were ordered to clean the small mosque and carry out the 70 corpses and bury them, they took eight other Arabs to do the digging of the burial site and afterwards shot them too and buried the eight with the 70, end of quote. So here we have something different from a battle or even a massacre by, by vengeful soldiers. This is an official cover-up of a war crime. And a crime it is. For the evidence, the bodies are themselves incriminating. They must be secreted away under the cover of darkness. And so aware are the criminals of the magnitude of their crime that they commit yet another one to cover it up. And that second crime, the deliberate murder of those forced to bury their brethren, evokes nothing less than the Holocaust. Now, thousands of people read this passage and shuddered. I read it and doubted. If there'd been a battle, not a massacre, why would such a criminal cover-up have been necessary? 
So I began to pull at the threads of this story, and as I pulled, it began to fray badly. Above all, there was the lifelong Arab inhabitant of Lida, one Faik Abu Manna, who lived through the fall of the city as a young man of 20. He claimed to have participated with a brother and a cousin in a 10-man detail ordered by the Israelis to remove the bodies from the mosque. This is what he said in a 2003 interview, one of many interviews he gave over the years, and I quote him. They said to go to the mosque and take the corpses out from there. We couldn't lift the corpses by hand. We brought bags and put the corpses in the bags, on the bags. We lifted them onto a truck. We gathered everyone in the cemetery. They said, burn. We burned everyone, end of quote. So Abu Manna obviously survived this grim task, and there's even a photo of him, I link to it in the book, in the Lida Cemetery, pointing to the place where he claimed the bodies were burned to ash. According to Abu Manna's wife, all those who participated in the detail were sent to a prison camp <coughs> and later were released. In the essay, I cite uh, English language memoirs by two other natives of Lida who report hearing accounts from members of the same detail after they were released by the Israelis. So from these sources, and these happen to be Palestinian, an entirely different story emerges. There is no dead of night cover up. There is just a cleanup. If Abu Manna is to be believed, there was nothing surreptitious about it. There was a giant bonfire in the cemetery, which he described as five meters high. And the local Arabs who were made to do it, they didn't end up in a mass grave. They went off to a prisoner camp under Red Cross supervision and later retailed their story after their release. So the most charged passage in the most charged chapter of the most widely read book on Israel since Tom Friedman's From Beirut to Jerusalem is easily unraveled. This in a book praised by an esteemed historian as free of even the slightest trace of fiction. Now, I don't claim to know exactly what happened then, but I know one thing that did happen now. Someone settled for a simple story when a bit more work would have turned up a complex one. That doesn't just happen. The simple serv story served a specific narrative purpose, and it worked. And the proof of, is that of all the book's readers, only I doubted it. Now, what's significant about this example isn't what it says about the events of July 12, 1948. If that were the only issue, only historians would care. And it's not about the author, whose inner motives are interesting but not newsworthy. Its significance lies in what this story reveals about the book's mostly Jewish American readers, what they want to believe and what they're prepared to believe about Israel. Once upon a time, they gave credence to tales of Israeli grit in Leon Uris's exodus. Now they give credence to tales of Israeli guilt in Ari Shavit's My Promised Land. And that's no small transformation with large implications for the present. The Middle East is a real place, but it is also a place of fantasy where things are said to have happened because we need them to have happened, to fill out the stories you want to tell us about ourselves and about others. In the other 24 chapters of my book, I show that this is true for academics, journalists, filmmakers, writers, and policymakers. I'm, I'm especially disappointed by academics, probably because I am one. I wrote that book 15 years ago, and one of five parts of this volume is devoted to how my colleagues threw out the shared principles I mentioned earlier. But let's leave them aside. The question, what do we really know, how do we know it, is the indispensable prelude to the question of what to do, which is a policy question. Now, in the fast-moving practical world of policy, the how do we know it question is often elided until some policy fails, and only then we discover what we thought we knew wasn't true at all. Uh, I won't recite all the famous instances, uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, Baghdadi's JV team, uh, come readily to mind. Sometimes special bureaucracies are established to ferret out the source of specific errors, the 9-11 Commission in this country, the Chilcot Inquiry in Britain, and so on. And most of these end up at the same place. The evidence was filtered and distorted by a bias, and that bias, because of a breakdown, went unchecked. Consider, for example, a small instance, Chapter 17. It's about uh, Chuck Hagel in his days as senator. Uh, Hagel was, at that time, a very fervent believer in linkage, which is a Middle Eastern domino theory. Basic premise, as goes the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, so goes the region. Hegel, when pressed on the limits of his thesis, insisted that he was only repeating what Arab leaders told him. But as I show, courtesy of WikiLeaks, Palestine hardly came up at all in Hegel's meetings with those leaders. Instead, his Arab interlocutors warned him about Iran, Iraq, the Shiite Crescent, and even about the stability of the Assad regime, this well before the Arab Spring. Now, my point isn't to pillory 
uh, Chuck Hagel, who may have changed his mind later on these issues. But at the time, he was exemplary of a much larger group of people who weaved an Israeli-centric narrative about the Middle East, about linkage, and then filtered out contradictory evidence. And that had consequences. Linkage proved to be a major diversion from a focus on far more dangerous and destabilizing conflicts in the Middle East. So while diplomats fiddled with the peace process, a large part of the Arab world came undone. And no one had the presence of mind to develop a strategy to prevent it. Of course, it's not the only reason things unraveled. I discussed them in other chapters. But linkage came with a huge opportunity cost. And the region pays it daily. Uh, the book is also a cautionary warning against a certain way of telling stories, the analogy. Uh, an analogy is a projection of the familiar onto the unfamiliar. Uh, it's not the same as a comparison, which measures two familiar things against one another. In Chapter 5, I discuss the debate over the phrase Islamic fundamentalism, against which everyone from Bernard Lewis to John Esposito warned but which still gained wide currency. For Americans, of course, fundamentalism evoked an aspect of American Christianity. <laughs> and although it's been largely replaced with Islamism, and that's a term with its own problems, it predisposed us to underestimation. Islamofascism, discussed in Chapter 7, is another analogy. As a sweeping statement, it too was misleading, although ISIL has uh, made me think the better of it, at least as a basis for a comparison. And then, of course, there is the Arab Spring, which was an analogy to Europe. As I argue in Chapter 16, it concealed the depth of the Arab crisis. Chapter 25 is entitled, Gaza is Auschwitz. And there I suggest that the very absurdity of this analogy is meant to make lesser misleading analogies somehow tenable. Uh, recently, two distinguished scholars have argued that the president should have a council of historical advisors, uh, which would mine analogies for insights. Well, why bother? Presidents and their aides mine history for analogies all the time. Uh, they're drawn to analogy exactly when the analysis is weak. Uh, and that's the real problem. And if I may use a metaphor, such a counsel would be like substituting a shiny walker for a cane for someone who might walk unaided with proper rehab. Mm. Um, so let me wrap up. I entitled my book The War on Error. Perhaps I should have called it The Global War on Error. Hmm. Uh, every capital, every agency of government, every think tank and university wages its own war on error. And those who rise to the top do so by winning important battles in that war. And those who sink to the bottom end up there by losing them. And it's my own war, too. I'm, I'm painfully aware that I'm not free of bias or immune to the errors that it might produce. So my hopes for this book uh, are modest. First, hope everyone who bought Shavit's book will buy mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more ambitiously still, um, I hope younger people who read it will, will challenge themselves to do better than we've done by adhering more faithfully to the basic principles we've often let lapse. And I don't dare to ask, I think, for more than that. So over to my critics. Thank you. Excellent.